Congress. So without further ado, Congressman Garrett Rice. Thank you all. Lord, thank you for the kind introduction, and uh, great, to, great to join you. You know, truly mentioned that, um, that I didn't have an incumbent to overcome, and, and she's right, I didn't, but I did have Edwin Edwards, and uh, <laughs> I'll tell you, <laughs> uh, lots of words come out to describe him, but uh, that, that was amazing. Um, so uh, my, my mother's here, and I heard her introduced earlier, and when I walked in, I saw this confused look in her face. Um, somebody called her and said, hey, your favorite child's going to be speaking to Republican women. So she was all excited to come, and then I walked in, and she looked at me, and this disappointed look at her. Sorry, Mom, it's me. It's me. I'm the one who's here. Yeah. Uh, uh, so look, I really do appreciate all of you being here today. I appreciate you getting out of your home and coming here and joining us today, because apparently if, if you stay home, you can actually make more money. And, um, and, and that's, that's not how America became the great nation, the great exceptional nation that it is today. Could you ever, could you ever imagine Coach O just saying, yeah, we're just going to stay home for this game. We're not going to go. I mean, could you ever, ever imagine somebody, something like that happening? No. You can't win a job. You can't win a football game. You can't win a contract. You can't make a sale by staying home. You've got to engage and you've got to work. And I, and I just want to remind you all, just four years ago, and Lori mentioned the 2016 flood a few minutes ago, folks came together, and it didn't matter if it was a complete stranger. We came together and we rescued people, and I will never in my life forget seeing people paddling inflatable mattresses to go help neighbors, inflatable or, or portable swimming pools to go help neighbors, and of course, boats and other more conventional floating uh, objects. Uh, people were cooking for complete same strangers, providing food for complete strangers, even housing complete strangers. Because when there's a need in our community, we all come together, we get up and we help each other. We don't, we don't lie back, roll over and give up, which is, which is what it looks like we're, we're seeing right now. I told y'all when we first got into that race with Edwin Edwards that I, I still view as being surreal. That the reason I got into the race wasn't because of politics. It wasn't because I ever had a desire to be a politician. I'll tell you why I got into the race. I got into the race because I'm a father, because I'm a husband, because I have great friends and family members in this community, because it's personal. Watching what was happening in Washington, I didn't feel represented. I was concerned about the future of our community, of our state, and our nation for our kids, for your kids, for our grandchildren. Because this country was on the wrong trajectory. Our values were not being represented. And you know, you look today at what's happening. You look at how coronavirus is being handled and, and, and folks are again being paid more to stay home. They're shutting everything down. We're rolling over and giving up under government mandates in some cases. Look at how we have businesses and even churches that are being shut down and unable to, to operate or worship or celebrate or come together in fellowship. Look at how you are seeing thousands of people that are being allowed to go loot and riot and burn down, but you can't have people coming together to congregate in businesses or in churches. Look at the murders and the violent crimes that are happening in our community. Just before I came over here, I got an email from one of our children's teachers that said that they just graded a series of quizzes and that the grades were substantially lower than last year. Well, duh. You're, you're, you're trying to teach them virtually through a computer and, and it's, it's not the in-person present teaching that that, that all of us experienced. And of course, this is a, a curveball. This is a challenge trying to teach under, under this environment. And look at the fights that you're seeing over the postal service. How do you make the mail partisan? And I'm going to talk about that one more in a little while. Now, Laura, in the introduction, talked about some of the wins, 
So I talked about how this was personal. I, personal. I talked about how I, I, I see a role for government, and I think it's the government that is, is supposed to be focused on these core competencies, like take care of our dang traffic problem. Keep the water out of our homes and businesses and in the ditches, the bayous, canals, and rivers. It's, it's, it's focusing on our military men and women, our, our national security, our foreign affairs. And you know what? Get out of our other personal decisions and lives and business. And so we focus on those core competencies. And, and, and I will tell you, projects literally conceived before I was born, before I was born, have been stuck. Like the West Shore project that was mentioned earlier. Three quarters of a billion dollars conceived before I was, before I was conceived. And, and that project's been stuck. That project's been stuck. And you know what? Working together with this president, we didn't just get it unstuck. It is 100% fully funded, $760 million in the bank, and construction is underway. Because I will tell you, this president understands you can spend millions today or billions tomorrow picking up the pieces, digging out the homes and businesses, and, and trying to reconstruct an economy that was destroyed. Right here in this area, it was mentioned the Comey Project. This project dates back to the early 1980s. Early 1980s. And the project is designed to provide flood protection for East Baton Rouge, Livingston, and Ascension. In some cases, bringing down water levels feet. And the project's been stuck. And we were able to work to address all of the bureaucracy and the wetlands mitigation and the cost share issues and secure, secure, $392 million, again, working with this president, this administration, that understands you spend millions today or billions tomorrow. The project's under construction as we speak and will be completed. The Corps of Engineers says by the end of next year, give them a little cushion. But it's going it's to provide us better services. And a decade later, in the early 1990s, the Baton Rouge Flood Control Project stuck since the early 1990s. Beaver and Blackwater Bayou in the northern part of the parish, and Jones Creek, Ward Creek, and Bayou Fountain in the southern part. $255 million. The fact that you have the same streets that have flooded since when I was a kid, but right at Corporate over by Mansour, it's like, how does that even happen? Every single time, the Garden District, and in Sherwood Forest, I mean, all these places, that, that when it rains, they go underwater. It, 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 how can it be this hard to fix these things? And so we've put funds, again, $255 million there, $112 million going directly to East Baton Rouge Parish, $68 million to Livingston Parish, on top of another $50 million we gave them, and $32 million to Livingston Parish to clean out the ditches and the creeks and the canals and the bayous, to improve pump stations and drainage, and to get the water out of our neighborhoods and into the Gulf of Mexico where we want it. It's a fundamental role of government that has they've completely failed that, not for years, but for decades. And, and on the other infrastructure area that was mentioned, the highway and the traffic. Look, we've had a, we've had a bit of a, of, a, of a pause there on our traffic problems in this region because of coronavirus. But we all know once this is over, we are going to be right back to an incredible, incredible gridlock all over our, our, our interstates and highways here once again. And this is an area where, again, government has failed. We've secured a billion dollars in projects, things like folks said would never happen over 40 years, the only place where the interstate funnels to one way, secured all the funding, developed an alternative, and moving toward opening that interstate up. Adding more lanes on I-10, we just secured $135 million for, for LA-1 down in Fushaw. And for those of you who go down to Grand Isle and Fushaw to go fish, because that's the top energy port in the nation, has national implications, and the road goes underwater when the wind blows. And I'm not kidding. <laughs> Largest grant in America because the president understands, Secretary Elaine Chow understands the relationship between investing in things or paying much more later when you're picking up the pieces with, with the energy impacts that would be happening naturally. Piku Lane is another example. They're building a, a new overpass. They're going to have a new exit between Seagate and Highland because everybody knows Highland exit backs up onto the interstate and stops the interstate from actually working. 
securing the funds, and that's moving really forward. And on top of all of those things, last one I'm going to mention is that we secured $1.2 billion for prospective flood protection projects because, you know what, West Shore was 1970s, Homey was 1980s, and Baton Rouge flood was 1990s. We don't need to be preparing for the past, we prepare for the future. So let's make those investments in projects to prepare us for 2030s and 2040s like we need to be doing. Now it was mentioned that this election coming up is an important election. And, and, and look, I've said that before, but this time I mean it. <laughs> no, really, this one, this one is a big deal. It is a big deal looking at what's happening. And if you look at, if, if any of you saw the Republican convention last night. Tim yeah. yeah. Scott, I mean, oh, I mean yeah. just, uh, not going to the park, but, but, um, but, but you know, you, you have two very different styles. If any of you watched the Democrat convention, the Democrat convention was all about emotion and creating, creating hatred and, and divisiveness and beating up on folks. And, and you saw the Republican one was talking about our future, talking about America's greatness, talking about our exceptionalism. Very, very different. And let me distill it even further. It wasn't just about talking about good things and, and trying to sow divisiveness and, and strong emotional, um, emotional frustration and negativity. It was about emotion versus facts. That's what it boils down to. It was about, it was about stirring people up emotionally in a negative sense versus facts. Why is it that people are bringing into our country Breaking into our country from virtually every country in the world. Why is that? Why, why is it that people aren't saying, hey, let me in Mexico, out of the United States? Why is it that people are coming here? Why is it that America continues to allow more people to immigrate to the United States than any other country in the world, yet it's still a fraction of those that want to come here? Why is it that people are coming from communist nations, and yes, AOC, I'm sorry, from socialist nations, to come here? Why, why is that? Is it, because, is it because they're convinced that AOC is going to be successful in converting us to socialism, so they're coming here all based on that hope? No, it's based upon the facts of our history and how this nation is incredibly unique. It is exceptional. And it is based upon this sole premise that if you work hard, if you work hard, you can achieve your definition of success. It, it, it allows you to reap the benefits of your hard work. It incentivizes, not incentivizes you to stay home, it incentivizes you to work hard. And I love that people have that incentive. I love that people want to come here. I'll say it again, not because of what they expect to happen with our government, because of the proven past of access to opportunity, access to achieve your definition of what the American dream is to you. So, so these people that are out there saying we need to move to Medicare for all, we need to provide universal basic income, which is basically what they did with the unemployment program. That is entirely contrary to the very unique strategy that caused America today to be the sole superpower, today to be this exceptional nation. And I want to remind you, this is fact. This is why people are trying to come here. They're coming here because of our success and because of, because of the facts. We're going into a presidential election where, the, where one of the major candidates sat at home for 90 days, 89 to be fair, 89 days, sat at home. This is, a, this is the leader of the free world, the leader of the most powerful country in the world, and you are staying home, not out there engaging and sharing your vision. Could you imagine if the roles were reversed and how the media would treat a Republican candidate who did that? I mean, they, they would be slandering this person on a daily basis. I've seen on, on Vice President Biden's website where he says, under my administration, we will have no oil and gas as part of this 
Green New Deal climate type strategies. Now, that's based on, that's based on we need to reduce emissions. Let's talk about emotion, the emotion of the Green New Deal and about the green pastures and future of our country that we're leaving for the, the next generation. Do you know which country in the world has reduced emissions more than any other country? Do you know which country that is? It would be America. And, and not, only, not only do we reduce emissions, we reduce emissions more than the next 12 countries combined. Combined. You make these, you make these big changes in strategy when you're failing, not when you're succeeding. We are leading the world. You remember Obama's clean power plan? He said you're going to use these energy technologies and you're going to reduce emissions by this much by this year. Do you know what we've done? We got rid of it and we reduced emissions 10 years earlier than he projected. 10 years. We did without regulations, without mandates, without picking winners and losers. 10 years. Do you know that, that we, can, uh, we can export our American natural gas then we're exporting it out of Louisiana to 36 countries today. 36 countries? That's what Obama, excuse me, that's what Biden wants to, not Obama, wants to shut down. Do you know that our natural gas is 41% cleaner emissions than Russian gas? So we're creating Louisiana jobs, we're increasing our, our exports, we're sending cleaner energy, and we're kneecapping Vladimir Putin. Why would you want to stop that? Which of those offends you? This is crazy. It is, it is absolutely factless what they're doing. This is what the next administration needs if we allow Biden to become president. It, it is all based on emotion. It's not based on what's actually happening. It plays on the energy issue. It plays into the hands of Russia, of China, of Saudi Arabia. Remember when Russia and Saudis got together and were dumping energy um, on, on the markets at the beginning of coronavirus, trying to kill the American energy industry? The Democrats are joining them in that. China's out there developing all these batteries, all the, uh, they're building all the batteries to store energy. What happens if we move to wind and solar? We become beholden to China. Did we not learn our lesson from the, the mask and gloves and protective equipment? So, so Biden is playing into the hands of China, into the plans of Russia, into the hands of Saudi Arabia. This is a, a, a very dangerous election. Now, how ironic is it that you hear Nancy Pelosi talking about election security and ballot sanctity? <laughs> hold on, hold on. But at the same time, at the same time, they're pushing proposals to have illegal immigrants, people from other countries, vote. I, I mean, you can't make this up. They're concerned about, about the sanctity of our election, but they want foreigners to determine who the president is. You can't, you can't make this up and take it a step further. Do you remember when the president was trying to add a, a, a question to the census that said, are you an American citizen? <laughs> Let me give you a statistic. You want to talk facts again? In Louisiana, we have six members in the House of Representatives. Six. California has 53. Do you know how many of those are attributable to people that are not Americans? I'm not making this up. Six to eight of them. In California, they have as many or more votes than we do in the House of Representatives due to people that aren't even American citizens. You want to talk about election security, election sanctity, and you have people literally from other countries, because you know how the electoral college works. They get votes in the electoral college based upon those illegal immigrants that are giving them more members of Congress, more electoral votes. Let's talk about the postal service. You've heard him say, oh, this is, this is absolutely uh, an effort by the Trump administration to stop ballots from being mailed in. Every single day, mail service handles 472 million pieces of mail. Every single day. 472 million pieces of mail. If every single voter voted by mail over probably a six-week period, you would have 150 million additional pieces. Right, which is a single digit increase. You can absorb that if every person, you can absorb it if you wanted to. So, so this whole uh, uh, mail crisis thing is bogus. Number two, they're removing mailboxes. You know how many mailboxes President Obama removed when he was there? 14,000. Did he do it for partisan reasons? No, he did it for efficiency. Just during coronavirus, mail has gone down 24%. Mail has gone down, I'm trying to remember, I think it's 36% over like the last 15 years. 
and you, we've seen huge struggles. So what you do is in, in any business, if, if your business is dropping, do you maintain that, that level as though you were 36 or 24% higher? No, you adapt to the size, you scale. People are emailing things now. They're taking pictures with their phone and, and texting it to somebody instead of putting it in the mail. You can do electronic consent on some documents off of your phone. So mail is dropping. You adapt to that business case. You don't go out and continue losing, as the Postal Service has, $135 billion. They're supposed to be self-sustaining. Do you know that the mail sorting machines today for parcels and flat mail have over 30% excess capacity? Who cares if we put the old ones back? You already have excess capacity. What are you doing? But, but these are the facts that, 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 that they don't want you to know. But because they're facts, they're not emotion. They create a false narrative, they get everybody emotionally riled up. When, when you look at the fact that overtime, oh, you cut overtime. You know what overtime was last year? 13%. You know what it is this year? 13%. It's a huge drop. <laughs> so so, so we, we cannot let, we can't let these folks go out there and, and create these false narratives and false issues based on emotion. We've got to inject facts into the, into the equation. We've got to inject facts. And, and this whole universal mail-in voting thing, as much as the idea may be attractive for ease of voting, how in the world can it be easier for me to, to vote than it is for me to get on an airplane, buy cigarettes, mom, I don't smoke, <laughs> sign up uh, for a Facebook account, if you ever tried to do that, my gosh, and send them your birth certificate, I mean, it's crazy the things that they ask. Create an Apple ID. How is it that that has more security than voting? That, that's wrong. You've got to be able to ensure or validate the people that are actually voting. And universal mail-in voting, it creates opportunity to undermine the sanctity of the elections, which they have reported to be uh, uh, expressing support for. Now, I want to I want to talk about um, I want to talk about one other issue. I talked about coronavirus and all of the all of the, the, the craziness that's going on there. We have two hurricanes or one hurricane and one whatever that was. <laughs> that, that I will tell you, we we prayed away. I mean, how amazing is that? I mean, you, you watch those forecasts and models, it was coming right to the west of Baton Rouge, right up the river. And, and all of a sudden it hits Plaquemine and makes a hard left turn. I mean, that was, that was, that was great. Um, but now we need to pray for our friend, friends in, in Southwest Louisiana with, with, uh, with Laura Kennedy. But, but, you know, the other thing that's been, that, that's been hot, and I made mention of this, was all the riots and looting and everything else. And look, based on what I saw with George Floyd, that was awful. It was, and I think it was wrong. But based on what I saw, and I know there's, New film with Ben Miller, we'll, we'll figure it all out. But, but what I saw was wrong. Now, you know what, there, there are a couple of young folks that are here, and, and I want to thank you all very much for being here. When you look at the demographics of the Republican Party, and, and the Republican women have been doing an absolutely remarkable job, so thank you, uh, President, for y'all's for work. Because y'all have been a consistent network that's been out there communicating and, and not in these little pods, you're communicating with your networks and just expanding. But you know what? You look at the demographics of our party. With the exception of these folks that actually chose to read beyond the facade and beyond the emotion and actually understand things, understand our history. With the exception of the few young people that are here, we, 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 we don't have the demographics that make this party sustainable. When you look at the Hispanic population, when you look at the African American population as members of the, of, of the party, we don't have enough representation within this party. And, and does, that mean, does that mean that we need to change our platform? No, I don't think it does. Because, because I will remind you, we are the ones, we are the ones that are supporting, defending, and creating the opportunity to achieve prosperity, to achieve your definition of the American dream. And, and, and I will tell you, you can throw me into any crowd in any room, and I mean that, any crowd in any room, and I will speak these truths and I will defend this till I die. I do. I believe this all the way down. I 
We tried, we tried to make changes to the, to the, to the, uh, the, the food nutrition program, the SNAP program, uh, one, of the, one of the many welfare programs that are out there. We tried to make changes to it because there was evidence in Alabama, in Kansas, and in Maine that when they did a pilot program and they connected those food programs, they connected them with job training and job assistance. In some cases, you had a 60% reduction in unemployment, 60%. That is great news for those that are impoverished. And, and you know what? Whenever we worked on that, you know who fought us? The Democrats. The Democrats fought us on providing a better pathway, a better solution for those that are impoverished, those that do not have a chance, do not have a shot at reaching their definition of success and that, that option of, uh, of, of reaching prosperity. I, I believe that there is a concerted effort within the leadership that, that is trying to prevent prevent people from being given that access to opportunity, trying to make them continue to be beholden to those very leaders and to that very party, rather than allowing them to get a taste of prosperity and freedom and opportunity. And, and, and so I'll say it again, put me in any room. But I think that we've got a job to do breaking through the young people and breaking through to a more diverse demographic, to African Americans, Hispanics, and others to help them to understand what our party stands for. And it is not what Nancy Pelosi says about us, that I just went through a few of those, whether it was climate, the election security issues, um, the, the, the Postal Service, it's not. The facts do not support those bogus claims. And so we all have a job to do there. Now, last thing I want to say, and I heard, I heard the President's uh, tweets mentioned earlier, and I, I want to be clear, I don't like it. I don't, and, and, and I, if I tweeted, if I said many of the things that he tweeted, my mom would put Tabasco on my tongue, as, as she did when I was a kid, until I started liking Tabasco. Um, and then she just slapped me. <laughs> and, and, and look, I'm gonna take it a step further, I'll tell you, I had our 10 year old standing from me to you with the president, and he started cussing, and no, that's not okay, it's not. But, but let me tell you something. You want to talk about when we get past this, we get past this facade of, of, of how he may make people feel sometimes. And you want to talk about facts. You want to talk about facts, record economic activity, standing up to China and saying you're not gonna steal our inventions and, and cause the America to lose not thousands, not hundreds of thousands, millions of jobs, hundreds of billions of dollars in economic activity. No, you're not gonna you're not gonna do that. We are going to provide opportunity to where you have the lowest unemployment rate for women, the lowest unemployment rate for African Americans, for Hispanic Americans, for Asian Americans, in some cases ever in American history, creating more opportunity, getting more teams working than we have seen in decades. At the end of the day, we've got to, to hold people accountable to these false narratives to this divisiveness, to these manufactured crises. And we've got to hold people accountable to facts. You need to ask yourself and you need to ask your friends to ask themselves, when they go to, into that election booth, they need to be asking themselves, who do you want leading us out of this global recession? Who do you want working to recreate opportunity for Americans and even those that legally immigrate here? Who do you want to do that? Do you want Biden? Hey, wake up. <laughs> You're on camera. Or do you want the president that has done this in his personal life, that has done this as president of the United States? And yes, I wish I could take his Twitter account away. I do. But 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 who do you want? Who do you want leading us out of that? You've got to ask yourself that question and ask your friends to ask themselves that question. Because that's what this is about. People that are going to, who is going to stand up for America when these other countries come and challenge us and steal from us and power our technology and undermine our national security? Who is going to help create economic opportunity to those that are, that are getting out of high school or finishing trade school or getting out of college to where they actually have jobs to go into? Who's going to do that? Which, which one of those people is going to actually stand up for us and lead us? There's only one answer there. 
And yes, the Twitter warts and all. Yes, there's only one answer there. And it's not, it's not campaign promises written on paper. It's fact. This is what I've done. There's evidence in his first term. And he's worked for Louisiana and helping with our flood and traffic issues as well. I know what I'm pulling the I know what I'm pulling the ballot for, right? I'm pulling the press of the button for. I do. And there's really no question at the end of the day. This elect this election is important. It is consequential. And we all have to show up. So thank you. Hey. Yeah. Second one, $255 million, involves the Corps of Engineers. There have been a lot of meetings going back and forth. Um, there was a holdup for a while because the state and the city couldn't come up with the cost share. They had to, they had to put up, uh, well, so they had to put up, I'm trying to remember the number, was it 21 or 40? 64 no, but, but no for the, for the real estate, for the words. Okay, so they had to come up with $40 million over about two and a half years, over about two and a half year period and then ultimately have to come up with another 20, 22 million over the next 30 years. They couldn't find the money to do, to, to access 255 million, they had to come up with, with about 40 million over two and a half years, and they couldn't find the 40 million. And so we were gonna lose the quarter of a million. And so we quickly engaged the governor and the mayor and started working with them and said, do you understand that, I think we got to the point where we're about two weeks away um, from actually them saying they were going to, if we didn't do it in two weeks, they were, they were going to uh, reprogram the cash. Um, but thankfully, we were able to get it all worked out. Um, I actually just spoke to the mayor yesterday because there's a lot of fighting going on with Livingston East Baton Rouge and Ascension over projects. If you do this, you're going to flood me. If you do this, you're going to flood me. And so we have been working as kind of referee among the three. And I just uh, spoke to the mayor yesterday. We're trying to get back together again to prevent lawsuits because there's already one law there's already two lawsuits. And we're trying to prevent two or maybe three more because that will just delay things first. So not as much, at the end of the day, not as much progress that you and I uh, wish would, would be happening, but uh, money is secured, it's in the bank. Um, uh, again, I will say on the Kobe project, um, there, there are a number of bridges that have to be built because right now you have Highway 19, Highway 67, Highway 61, and the railroads that all are at grade and we're gonna become a data canal in them. So those have to be converted to bridges. Contracts have been issued for those. All of the clearing and growing work for the entire alignment has been done. They've removed all the trees and everything else. And so they will start digging this year on that project. Thank you. Thank you for your time. You bet. Do you remember? Do you remember I had to cut the video? Yeah. And I cut the video, 
And then the video would go, oh, look, there's my mom. And I recorded, my mom goes, how did you know where I was going to be? <laughs> I, I, I recorded it before. I couldn't see it. Got to kick out of that. How do you tell the TV show it's tiny and black and white? How do you think of it? The large show is dancing. And last month, I told everyone in here, we need more people who look like me. You do? She agrees with the, the need for more diversity in our party. Look, I, I gotta tell you something. I, I can't even begin to tell you how much I commend your courage. Um, look, you, 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 people get, and not just you, people get in these in these bubbles where all of you, all of your friends, all of you here is, is more liberal or democrat ideology and policies and things like that. And the fact that you, the fact that y'all actually spent time looking at this research and it, I mean, that's a put you in a very uncomfortable situation. But I'll tell you, it means that your courage overflows. So, so thank you. Yeah. 